Hi, everyone. I'm Caroline Zakarian, and I work in the Office of Civics and Community Services here at the Los Angeles Public Library. Welcome to Financial Literacy Month. Today's program is called Introduction to Financial Planning Basics. It was brought to you by the Financial Planning Association of Los Angeles and the Los Angeles Public Library. Today, Jamie Rugg from the FPA will provide an overview of the financial planning process and highlight steps from gathering information to implementation to monitoring. The audience will also learn about setting goals, budgeting, managing debt, saving, investing, and more. We will have a brief Q&A after the presentation, so please send us your questions throughout the program. Thank you, everyone. Take it away, Jamie. All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for being with us today. We are very excited to get started with talking about introduction to financial planning. So we'll get started with our slides here. Perfect. Okay. So first and foremost today, what we want to cover, we really want to talk about what is financial planning? Why is it important? We hear this term of, okay, there's some sort of, it's important to have some sort of financial plan, but what does it actually mean? And what does it mean to me? So the end of today, what I really would like to have is for, to really view a, a grasp of the various components of what makes up a financial plan, introduce the steps to build one for you and your family, then also talk about tools and the ways you can start to put the strategies into action. With, like with a lot of things in life, your financial plan is meant to grow and change and shift with you over time as your life circumstances change and as your priorities change. So one thing to do, if you are with us live, if you have a piece of paper handy, that'd be great to take it out now, have a pen and jot down some notes as we get started because we'll, we'll take you through the various components of what comprises an actual financial plan. And as we're going through, please feel welcome to add in any questions into the chat. As Caroline is mentioning, we'll be sure to address them at the end, and we want to answer as many questions as possible for you today. Our presentation is probably going to be around 50 minutes, so we'll have plenty of time to just address any direct questions you have for us. So what is financial planning, right? It's really, we view it as a certified financial planner myself and as um, a representative of the Financial Planning Association of Los Angeles. What it means to us is really, it's a means in a way to get you to the life that you want. Like we're mentioning here, money, it's not the journey, it's the fuel. The life you want is the destination. We want to help you build a process and steps to get you to where you want to go. So really think about truly what matters most to you, what matters to you, to your family, what are your life goals? So we think about it, if we think 10, 15, 30 years down the line, what do you want life to look like? That could be something as specific as, oh, the type of house you want to live in. Maybe it's the type of lifestyle you want. Maybe it's where you're going to be living or what your experiences you're going to be having on a regular basis. I want everyone to just take a, a few seconds here and actually think about further down the line, what do you want life to look like? And when we think about that, that is, the, that is our end goal. We want to build towards what matters most to us individually. And there are no right or wrong answers for what you want that life to look like. But what we want to do, though, is then break that down into steps. What are the financial steps you get to do to get you to reach those goals? Once we come up with a plan, and there are going to be various pieces, a plan is only basically a piece of paper or a, a Word document unless you actually implement it and take it and bring it into action. So if you once you do create that plan, make sure you have some action steps. Even if you're starting small, so you have some takeaways, you can actually start to apply it to your life. And again, as always, financial planning, it is a lifelong process. Over time, as you accomplish small goals or something changes or a jobs change or your family situation changes, you'll want to shift and adjust your plan over time. It's only as good as the how up to date it is for you. So there are so when we talk about uh, financial planning in the context of you know me being a certified financial planner, and in that in that world, we really are talking about kind of the core components of what makes up the financial planning world. It's a it is a comprehensive and systematic process for getting your financial house in order, in order for you to meet your goals. So instead of just thinking about investments, and that's the one we hear about the most, and investments are certainly very important. We really want to take a, that holistic view that overview look at all of your financial life, all the various aspects that impact your financial life, because they actually do work together in some ways. 
we want to make sure we're accounting for all of the various pieces. And we're going to cover a little bit about each of these today. So uh, in our financial planning pyramid here, it covers items such as insurance, employee benefits or you know retirement plans, things that you are offered through work, certainly investments and investment planning. We do go through tax planning as well, looking at how, you know, what is my tax rate? How do I be as tax efficient as possible? You know, how do I plan for taxes? Retirement planning, how do I save for the long term? Uh, how do I get myself in the best situation possible for the long term? And then also um, education planning, which isn't mentioned here. How do we plan for a child's college or for my college or a loved one's college education or you know, some sort of schooling and also estate planning? I ha well, how do I ensure that I, towards my later years, I'm living the life that I want to be living? And if I do have assets to pass on, that they're going to the people I want and I have all the protections in place to make sure my wishes are followed. And also related to retirement planning, we did have a session last week on retirement planning. If anyone would like to get more of a deep dive into retirement planning in particular, I would encourage you to look back uh, through LAPL's YouTube channel from last week. And okay, so as we get started in talking about your financial plan with your piece of paper, these are the questions I want you to think about right now. How much do you spend every month and is your income high enough to cover all of your expenses? So this really leads to talking about a spending plan. And we're going to go through each one of these in a little more detail through over the course of this next hour. But so just think about as you, if you have your piece of paper in front of you, even if you don't know the exact dollar amount you're spending each month, just think about it. Just write down some of those high level items. You know, what's my rent or my mortgage, auto payments, how much I think I spend on dining expenses, all of that. And is your income high enough to cover or are you, is each month a little bit of a challenge making sure you have everything uh, covered, which it certainly is for, for most people today, especially with how expensive everything is. Other things to consider, what do you want to set aside if you wanted to save for retirement, potentially buy a new car, buy a house, pay for college? What do we need to set aside for the future? So we're, we're kind of carving that out from our, our spending. So that's really going to more towards saving and investment. If you were something were to happen, whether it's lose a job, become sick, a loved one is ill, something else happens, how do you ensure that what that you're taking care of those potential risks? So that's where kind of some of the insurance or managing risks comes into play. And then do you have enough money if there is some sort of emergency, medical emergency, a sudden job loss, a sudden car expense that didn't anticipate? Uh, if you do you have the income right now to cover some of those expenses? So that's where we'll talk a bit more about an emergency fund and how much you, you should consider having in an emergency fund just for those just in case what happens if something happens unexpectedly. All right. So as we're thinking through those various pieces, keep those kind of questions in mind for yourself. So this is these are really kind of the main initial six steps to the financial planning process that I as a financial planner do with my clients and that a lot of us at the Financial Planning Association also do with clients. First and foremost, and it's all this is a repeatable process, we'll cover this again at the very end. Of course, we want to gather the information. What do I have? What do I need? Where am I at? What accounts do I have? What do I have access to for in terms of saving and investing? Do I have a, you know, a company 401k plan or 403b or a 457 that I have access to? So gather the various information that you have it kind of in front of you if you can. Step two is really think about those goals, right? That we talked about at the very beginning of the session. What is most important to me? What matters to me? What am I trying to aim for? Whether it's one year from now, five years from now, 10 years from now, and so on. And think about that when you're looking at, at kind of the, the upcoming pieces. What do you want life to look like? And do you have specific goals we want to move towards? Assess your current situation. Okay, so this is what I have. I have my information. This is what I'm trying to do. Let's see where these can be in the middle and how I get to plan for the future. And then let's see, devise an, an actual action plan. Uh, what, how do we, how are I gonna, am I gonna get from step A to, to point A to point B here? Then like we said, it, a plan is only as, is only worthwhile if you actually take the time to implement it. So we wanna make sure any changes we wanted to make, whether that's opening up a new account, you're setting up a new amount you're setting aside in your retirement savings, money you're putting into an emergency fund each month. It's only as good as if, if you actually implement or execute the plan. And over time, we want to monitor and adjust the plan, make some tweaks as needed, 
as you start to reach certain goals, maybe you're able to pay off that one credit card. Now you're moving on to the next one. Make sure you're monitoring and adjusting your plan over time. And I apologize for the typo there in that one. Okay, so first and foremost, we're gonna go through each one of these steps. First and foremost, we wanna gather our information. So again, if you are with us right now and you're, or you're, you have that piece of paper in front of you you're, or you're just thinking about what this looks like for you, think about your financial resources, right? What do you have and what are you committed and you're required to pay on a monthly basis? So calculate any you know, income. Here's whether it's W-2, 1099, whatever you're earning from a job right now or a pension or from any other sort of, of income. Jot that down along with, okay, now it's the fun, less fun part is keeping track of expenses in our debts. What is that mortgage payment or that rent payment, car payments, gasoline for travel or bus fares, dining out, you know, gym, prescriptions, medication, insurance premiums, uh, auto insurance, going down the gamut. And if you can log into at the end of this, into one of your, your banking, your checking accounts just to see some people I will say are very good at keeping track of all of the specific details of where their money is flowing. They know exactly where it's going. A lot of us that I fall into the second camp are not as great with this and don't necessarily enjoy it, but it is important to revisit this at least once a year, if not more frequently, just to get an idea of if there's, especially if there's money creeping out, you feel you should have a little bit left over. Where is it going? If we don't know, it's just, it's kind of funneling out. So also look at those debts. Are there education loans, you know, car loans, all those other pieces, credit card payments that are required. And then keeping how much you have in your bank accounts, savings, your 401k plans. Do you have insurance policies? What kind do you have? Are there life insurance policies? Are there anything else you want to keep track of? And again, while you're doing this, it's great to have it, whether it's on your computer or if it's in paper, you have all this together stored in a safe location. So you know, you have access to it in one place. But then also too, like that's, so that's some of the quantifiable information, right? The things we think about, okay, this is, these are my expenses. This is what I'm required to pay. But also in terms of gathering information. And then if I was meeting with you directly, I would say, all right, let's tell me about, yeah, what, what matters to you? How do you feel about saving and spending? Do you, what are kind of the money stories you have around saving and spending? How did, what was your relationship to money growing up? So that, in that part of our values, those culture beliefs, that really does impact kind of our view on our finances. And it's important to think about that too and take that into consideration as you're planning out and kind of gathering information for, uh, for your financial plan. All right, step two. So now we are going to determine those goals. What do you want? And this is where we really want to think, even though it feels really kind of ethereal, oh, I've of course, I'd love to have as much as possible and, you know, be in great shape. But it's it's really important, though, because it's it's not just about a, a dollar figure. This dollar figure means I'm going to be OK, period. That's not how life actually ends up working out. And we, we want to understand the meaning that you have, what money means to you, what matters to you, what values are how you have. That's really what should guide the, your plan, not the actual just the dollars themselves. So what do you want to have in your life, whether that's physical, house, car, things like that. What do you want to do? What's going to bring you fulfillment in life? What are you enthusiastic about? What do you enjoy doing? How do you enjoy spending your time? Or what do you want to be? What do you want to potentially work towards down the line that maybe you're not able to do right now? Think about those things too, not just the, the physical, like the actual bottom dollar things. And again, what, what values are most important to you? With maybe for some people it's spending, you know, I want to be able to spend as much time as possible with my family, or I want to spend as much time as possible with an aging loved one, or I really enjoy doing X or being outdoors or travel or whatever it is. We want you to be able to build around that things that are going to bring you the most value in life. That's what should, what should lead here. So some of the specifics, and I'm sorry if you can't quite see me on the bottom part here on the left. Um, where do you want to so determine your goals, goals? Where do you want to go? And where do you want your life to go? Are they short term? Maybe it's, yeah, I have got some credit cards. The interest rates are crazy right now. I would love to be able to get this under control. Maybe it's, I want to buy a house or I want to buy a car in a few years, or, you know, you want to actually change careers and shift to something else. So those we would determine as more of short term goals. We're thinking six months to, you know, maybe up to three to five years out. And then also, where do you want your life to go? What trajectory do you want your life to take? So thinking a little bit longer term, 
Is it college education for yourself or trade school for you or your children? Do you want to provide some risk protection for your family, for yourself? Do you want to make sure your family would be okay just in case something happens to you? Is one of your life goals to retire comfortably and maintain your same lifestyle that you have right now in retirement? So what is really important to you? Uh, and I want you to prioritize this list. So not only just kind of jot down some of the pieces that are important, but actually kind of assign a, a value to yourself or asterisk or circle or highlight or underline or whatever. But think about this. And I'm going to give everyone a few moments here just because I, I really do want you to envision what some of the, your short-term goals and some of your longer-term goals would be. And then let me say, is it possible for us to move the, um, the location of the screen from the left to the right for where the video is, if we can? All right, so prioritize your list. Okay, so another moment or two to think about what matters to you, determining those goals, and we are going to move on. Okay, to assess, thank you so much, uh, to a step three, and we want to assess your situation. So there is a lot more to this, right, then, okay, it's nice to have, I'd love to have these goals, I want to be able to accomplish these things, but how do we actually start to go about that process? What does that actually look like? So next step three is obviously a, a, a pretty big one, and a lot of us know some of these things instinctively when you know. This is how much I'm bringing in. This is how much I'm spending. But we want to kind of take a look at it line by line for this. So first and foremost, like we talked about earlier, does your income meet your expenses? Do you have enough? Are you each at the end of the month? Are you feeling like, OK, I'm I have plenty left over. I'm actually in a good place. I'm able to save more. Or are you feeling, you know what, it's actually pretty tight right now. Or, wow, I'm actually having to go into a little bit of debt right now because everything is so expensive. And again, there is no judgment whatsoever, just more of this is our opportunity to just kind of take a realistic look at what's going on and then just see where we're at and see where, if 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 any, where we would make some tweaks. Are you dependent, again, on anything like pity lenders? Avoid, avoid, avoid if you ever can. Um, rent to own stores, credit cards, and other higher interest debt, particularly payday lenders. We certainly want you to be very, very careful of that, but um, certainly we know that a lot more individuals in our country are now putting more onto credit cards and other types of high interest debt. Do you find that you need that to supplement to get you through at the end of the month? Again, no judgment. It's just one of these things we want to make note of as we're kind of developing our individual plans. Are, do you feel that you're saving enough for your goals? Are you able to set aside, if you know you want to put a new down payment or you're going to, you want to buy a new car in the next year or so, do you have enough? Do you feel like you have enough left over each month to actually set aside a little bit of money, even if it's $25 or, you know, something like that? Do you feel like you have enough each month to actually put towards those future goals? Is your credit report accurate? When's the last time you actually looked, logged in and checked your credit report? We'll talk about this a little bit more later. And I know in some of the opportunities for the, through the lifelong learning at LA Public Library, there are some opportunities to actually pull your credit reports. We do have one of those, I believe, usually in October as well. But every one of us has three uh, the opportunity to receive three or one from each of the three credit bureaus uh, report, a free report each year. It is a good practice to do that every year just to make sure there aren't any weird things that have shown up or something that might be completely inaccurate that could be affecting your credit. Because if we do have issues on our credit, we want to work on them now before we actually need to go out and potentially get some financing or loans and we have those uh-oh, something's on here that I didn't realize and now I have to handle and see if I can do this quickly. Are you insured against the right risks? So there are, obviously the insurance world is, is a substantial, very large world um, that today, but there are very, very, quite a few different types of insurance policies. Are you insured against the right types of risk? And we'll talk a bit more about that. Are you protected in case something happens to you? Do you have enough auto insurance in case you were to get into a car accident, an expensive car accident? Do you have the right proper health insurance for you just so that if something were to happen to you that you're in a good situation? And then are your expectations realistic? And that one, <laughs> to me, I suppose it feels a little bit harsh to think of it that way, but are your expectations realistic? It, it's If it's, you know what, I wanna be able to, if I'm in my late 40s, I wanna be able to retire in five years, 
might not be realistic. However, maybe something I want to be able to save enough the next couple of years for a down payment for a condo or a house or something. Can I do that? How are we thinking that what you would like to have happen? Are these realistic? Or also, is it realistic that I will be able to stop spending as much and actually cut down my expenses? Or is it really realistic that I will be able to buy that house with the current interest rate with how expensive everything is? So we do want to kind of look at this with eyes wide open as we as we think about what's going on and what our situation is. So tools in your spending plan, uh, as we think, because this all this really right now is geared towards assessing and also kind of the spending. So take a look at uh, your checkbook, those ATM slips, again, credit card statements, open your banking app, log into your bank account online. I don't know how many people are using their checkbook to balancing yet. If you are, that's fantastic. I feel like that's a, almost a lost art these days. But take a look through. And even if it's just one month or you look through two months as an exercise and as a, a follow up or homework to this succession, take a look through and actually see where your money is going. We, Unless we know, we can't actually do anything about it. I can certainly say I have little things that fly out that I am not quite realizing how much money is going towards that. So it's one of those things every few months I need to do the same thing and kind of go back through and see where I can cut things out that I don't really need to be spending on. So figure out how much you're spending and on what. We want to think about these in these various categories. Like we talked about, of course, rent or a mortgage payment, utilities that are you know pretty much fixed, cell phone bill, groceries, all of those things that are really required. How much these are things we have to spend. These are fixed expenses that we have each year. Restaurants, insurance, medical shopping for ourselves, gifts, spending money, unknown categories. I think most people will find there's a lot more in the unknown uh, than we anticipate, etc. So how much is left over at the end of the month? In determining your spending plan, write down where your money is actually being spent into each of these categories. It's going to really help you get a better picture of where you're at and where your situation is. And as much as this stuff is, is pretty straightforward, right? Like, okay, let's take a look. Let's figure it out. Let's go through the, the specifics. The exercise isn't always that fun to see, but sometimes you'll find areas where you really like, wow, I am not getting a lot of value from this or this or this. It's actually not that crucial to me. When I look at my spending versus what my some of my goals are, and if these goals are really important to me, where, if I have to, where can I start to cut? Where can I start to actually allocate more money towards things that really matter versus what it where, you know, the money that I'm not even realizing is flowing out of my account? Are there areas where I can save? Uh, whether it's 50, 100, a couple hundred, a thousand plus dollars each month that I don't even realize I'm spending. So write out that monthly expenses. And there are tons of different budgeting apps and other things that try to make the process a little bit more fun. Uh, but write it out, whether it's with an app, in an Excel sheet, Google sheet, or on a piece of paper, it's going to help you develop your spending plan so you have better control and understanding of where you're going, what you're spending on, and actually how to get you to the, uh, the, that, those future goals, whether it's saving and with spending. All right, so what else specifically goes into this? We've talked about this a bit, but it is this part is really crucial to understand. So things that are fixed, things that we really cannot budge much. Housing, unless we were to decide to pick up and move, which is everyone's pretty much least favorite thing to do, that's pretty fixed. Insurance payments, whether it's for health insurance, car insurance, all of that, that is pretty set as well. Uh, utilities, keeping the power on, internet, water, all that pretty can fluctuate, but it, and it has gone up for sure, but it is pretty static. Same thing with debts, whatever debt we agree to, to, to spend or to pay each month, whether it's credit card minimums, mortgages, loans, student loans, um, as well as savings. So I really want everyone to think about savings should actually be part of your fixed expenses. It's, it's, Especially when things feel tight, it's really hard to view it that way because you're like, but I don't technically need this money right now. I actually want it for later. But we want you to kind of shift some of that thinking to actually make savings one of those fixed categories. So as you're going through this and you figure out, all right, in order to reach some of these goals, this is really how much I want to have left over. We want you to start to think about having savings as this is important. I'm paying myself. I am taking care of me in the future, future me. So I'm going to make this a fixed expense before I do all the other fun things in the meantime. Um, so variable expenses, things that can shift uh, to some extent, certainly some more than others. Food, those we can choose whether we want to cook at home or we want to go out to dinner a bunch or order food in and, and whatnot. 
clothing, transportation to some extent, entertainment, again, giving gifts to charity, actual gifts to family members for the holidays or birthdays, et cetera. Um, yes, and, and then the flip side, of course, the opposite end that we're comparing this to is our income. So what income do we have pay, whether it's also from a pension or social security or disability payments or an unemployment, maybe we're receiving child support, maybe we're receiving some income from some of our investments all you want to think about all of these things to offset, right? All maybe it's some other type of real estate or whatever it might be, or an annuity payment. Think about all of the, all of these different areas to offset. And then naturally, one area for us as financial planners, again, that we really want to emphasize and hope that's coming across is spend your money and your time as much as possible on things that are important to you and your family. Money is a means to an end. It doesn't feel like that on a daily basis, especially when how expensive things are. But we really want you, all, a lot of this goes uh, to living your best life, whatever version that is for you. And that's where we want you to think about money as a resource so that you can get the most fulfillment and enjoyment out of it. So spend your money and your time because that is also essential and valuable. We just know we have no guarantees as much as possible on things that are important to you and to your family, rather than the things that just fly out of your accounts. Make it targeted to focus on things that are gonna be meaningful to you in your life and to the life of your family members. All right, so a couple tips before we move on to kind of the next step in our action plan here. So make this a part of a family affair. If you have family, if you have kids, or you have older parents or other loved ones you care about, make budgeting a part of a family affair. The more also that we can expose the younger generations to some of these principles early on, the better off they're gonna be later on in life when they start to have their own income or jobs and all of that. So make it part of a family affair. Maybe it's, you, you all decide as a family, all right, where do we wanna spend and not spend? What is gonna be meaningful for us as a family? If we're thinking like we wanna go do something fun as a family together in, you know, in, in two weeks or in a weekend or sometime this month, have it actually be a family discussion and talk about it uh, so you can actually work towards that together. And then the family is all, everyone's in on it too, uh, as part of the plan. So choose where to spend and you choose where to not to spend. That's the key part. You're actively choosing where you want to spend your money and you're choosing where you don't want to. Um, as much as possible, don't spend more than you earn. That's, that's kind of the core component. And I will tell you, it doesn't matter if someone in retirement has five hundred thousand dollars in a in a retirement account, or you know, fifteen million in a in a retirement account. It all comes down to how much money they're spending versus what they're actually their income is. If you are overspending, it doesn't matter how much. Honestly, at some level, how much you're, you actually have. If you're overspending, that becomes a habit, and that's actually what ends up being the, the biggest predictor of whether or not someone is going to have and continue to have the lifestyle they want to live later on in life. So don't spend more than you earn as much as possible. I know that it's easier said than done, certainly, but do whatever you can to set yourself up so you're in a good situation. And like we were just mentioning, pay yourself first. Treat that savings, treat yourself like a fixed bill, a fixed expense you have to take care of each month. You want to be sure you are setting up yourself for success on the line. You're taking care of you versus all of the other extraneous things that might not be quite as crucial at the end of the day. If you look back on the course of a month or a year, if you're working on your saving on your spending plan, I was able to set aside, you know, five thousand dollars by through hard work instead of me ordering, you know food delivery a number of times and buying this thing or that thing or this clothing or whatever else. And I, I, I think one area too, where we, we certainly don't want anyone to feel like they have to sacrifice today in order to save for the future, but it's about you understanding what your goals are and you making those, those calculated choices for yourself. I think everyone should be able to enjoy on a daily basis and still be able to take, take part and, and do things that are going to bring you a lot of value but just make sure you're thinking about you want to be paying yourself first for the future. And then lastly here, make adjustments. Your goals are going to change over time. Income's going to change. Expenses are going to change. So make these shifts, whether it's in that app, it's on a piece of paper, or even you have it in your head, like this is kind of what I want to set aside each month. 
think about that and then make adjustments over time because it will change. And when we talk about change and goals changing too, we, if, if there's ever a life event you have, whether it's a birth in the family, someone passing away in the family, a divorce, marriage, anything like that, those are considered major life events that that should always kind of necessitate or kind of get you to thinking of, okay, it's time for me to look back at my financial plan and my spending plan and see where I need to make some adjustments. All right, so going into step four, talking about devising an actual action plan. All right, so we know these are the goals I'd like to have. These are the things that matter to me. I still don't know fully how to quite do this. This is what I have for expenses. This is what I have for income. Let's start to put that together. So determine what you need to reach those goals. If you're looking at, all right, I really want to be able to, it would be really valuable to me to be able to put this down payment down and to be able to have my own place, something I own and love in the next couple of years. Realistically, what is that going to look like? How much money do I need to set aside? What kind of house am I targeting? If I'm thinking I need to put down, you know, 10 or 20%, ideally 20% for a down payment, that what's that dollar amount? What do I have now? How do I start to figure out how to, how much would I need to set aside on a monthly basis in order to get there? Uh, where can I change or where would I need to change or shift my saving and spending habits if I want to make sure to reach that goal in that time frame? Or it's okay if it's a couple of years later. But if for each one of those goals, think about that line by line. Do I need to make any adjustments? Or do I just need to shift where I'm saving money here and putting it in this account? Or I'm spending here, I'm going to start to save it instead. Choose the appropriate savings and insurance products. I certainly always want everyone to be mindful of insurance products, they absolutely can be essential. And certainly for auto insurance and medical insurance, we really have to have them. Other types of permanent life policies and annuities, things like that, I want everyone to be very cautious and make sure you understand everything behind their conflicts of interest with the people that are selling you those. So just make sure you're thinking that through and reading the fine print um, for some of those types of things. But um, choose appropriate savings and in, in insurance products. And I'd also add also savings accounts or investment accounts in order to reach those goals. Get control of your finances. So create an, a new spending plan that includes those goals for you for the future. Pay off debts wherever you can and clean up your credit report. And certainly we want you to establish an emergency fund. Uh, so when we talk about paying off, off debts, and we'll, we'll go into this in just a moment with some of the next slides here. Uh, there are a couple of different ways to approach it we want to talk about. But first and foremost, though, in establishing an emergency fund, do you have accessible at least two to three months of expenses today? If something were to happen, do you have money you can dip into so that you're not pulling money from retirement accounts or from or you having to sell things that you didn't mean to sell all of a sudden? That part is really, really vital that everyone has. It's the, if there's only one takeaway you have from our conversation today, please make sure you're setting up an emergency fund for yourself. It will help reduce so much stress on you and your family, just so you know you have a few months worth of expenses ready to go. But before we get into that, let's talk a little bit more about debt management. And I'm glad that nothing is really visible here. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Okay, so let's talk about debts. Debt is a reality for most people today. Um, but here's the example we're going to use here. So let's say you're going to recarpet your house and you put it on your credit card. If you only make the minimum payments, this is actually how much that new carpet would really cost you. And I think a lot of us are familiar with this, but sometimes it's kind of shocking to see the numbers. So the, the carpet is going to cost $4,000. The interest rate is 18%. We all know right now interest rates are north of 2021 20, up to 27, 28% right now with how interest rates have risen. The first minimum payment as example is $160. So over the course of us paying back these minimum payments, the total payments we're making $6,273. And it takes us 10 and a half years, 10 and a half years to pay off this $4,000 payments. So we've got something sitting in the back of our heads that we have to pay down for 10 and a half years because we're making those minimum payments. So again, this is self-explanatory, but what did that 2,273 and 47 cents in interest that you paid to the bank get you? Absolutely nothing. Uh, if you can use other ways, if there are other ways that you can structure, or if you know you might have 
something coming up for a renovation or again, whether it's saving for a car or saving for college or saving for a down payment, if you know there's something big at some point or you have a goal to do this, this is where we want to shift. Can I start setting aside $50 a month, $100 a month, even just to help? So even if I did still have to finance part of this, I know I already have a big chunk of it ready to go so I can pay off that that uh, part of that cost. But yeah, that's in the, the crazy part to me is that it's going to take 10 and a half years to if you pay those minimum payments. If you ever look at the very back of your credit card statements, and if you have done this before, some of you have probably seen it. If you haven't, I would encourage you to do it. It's it, because they're required to tell you if I pay a, the minimum amount each month, how long is it going to take me to pay off this balance? And it'll be like 21 years. You're gonna, it's going to take you 21 years because that is how it's structured with interest rates are just enough. You're paying off a little bit more each month, but they're really, you're financing thousands of dollars uh, that are not going to you. So what are the appropriate uses of debt? Because certainly there is a time and place for debt. There's no way that we can all just be able to out, po out of pocket afford everything we want to do. That'd be great, but that's not the reality today. So use debt only to finance what we kind of, the good debts really for finding an affordable house. Not a house that's going to stretch and make you feel, oh gosh, this monthly payment is so stressful. Like I, I'm uncomfortable. That is not what we want. We want you to make sure you can, you can get into a house that is comfortably affordable for you so that you can still save, invest, still enjoy the things on a day-to-day -day basis, go on trips or take care of your, your kids or whatever the things are that matter most to you. Um, we want to make sure that, that the house payment you know, ideally is underneath 30% of your actual gross income, so your income before taxes. Uh, financing education, whether it's for college, trade school, vocational school, anything like that, education, private school, that's uh, an appropriate use of debt because those, those, as we know, amounts are exceptionally high um, and cost quite a bit. Maybe also you want to start a goal of yours, a value of yours has been to develop a small business. And actually be able to start something that you're really passionate about. That's an all, another appropriate use of debt, but again, make sure you have a business plan. A lot of times banks, if they're lending you money, will also want to see your business plan in order to approve the financing. So these are appropriate uses of debt. Other things, if it's smaller payments or you know down payments or buying things you really want, instead of putting on a credit card, it's much better if you can to have it on savings, you already have the money ready to go or to pay it off right away. But that is a, a nice situation. You know, what do we do if we already have debt? Like you're like, Jamie, that's great. But I, this is the reality is things are expensive and I already have debt. How do I start to get rid of it? How do I develop an action plan to start to get control of this? Just like we were talking about doing, even though it's not fun, come up with knowing what you owe. What, who are the creditors, you know, what banks or what credit cards or loans do you have outstanding? Write it all out on one, on one, piece of paper or on one thing where you can access it easily so you can keep track of it. What are the balances? What are the interest rates? It's really important to understand the interest rates. It's one of the first things we do whenever we're meeting with a pro bono client or with a client that I work with at my firm. We want to understand how expensive is this debt, right? Which, which interest rate is the highest? Because that might mean we want to pay it off first. What are the monthly minimum payments? Where is this account located? Also, what date does it pull from? Because a lot of times trying to balance your your income versus your expenses you really need to know what date that you know that bill is going to come due and then decide on a plan so if you know you have extra debt that's okay let's think about where can we start what do we want to start with so usually there are two ways people like to go about it some like to say okay if i have three accounts they all have various different balances. They ha all have different interest rates. Some people like to approach it from, you know what, I actually want to start with the smallest one first and I want to get rid of that. And then I want to move up to the next, the next smallest amount and get rid of that. Some people like to approach it from, okay, I'm going to start with one that has the highest interest rate, whatever has the highest rate I'm paying the most on a monthly basis. I want to get rid of that one first because that one's actually the most expensive. Um, and then so and then I'm gonna go down to the next highest interest rate and so on and so forth until I'm able to actually clean out some of these debts. And I do realize a lot of this does take a lot of time. This is not something that can happen overnight. And I know that's why it can feel so daunting. So that's where you want to list this out and see, okay, this is if especially if, if debt is kind of stressing you out. All right, I, I need to come up with a target approach. I have to pay the minimum payments regardless over here, here and here across the board. But if I, I do not like having this sit here, so where can I start to throw a little bit more money 
and start to pay this down more quickly. So those are kind of the two main ways. You do the snowball approach. So you can do, I want to I want to start with the highest interest rate, clear that out and move on and down and down and down. Or I, you know what, it's going to be really motivating for me to start with the lowest, the smallest balance. So I can clear that out and then I have one less thing to worry about. Whichever method you like the sound of better, go with that and stick with it. It's going to take time, but that's how you get start to get there. So for example, we said, pay back extra on the highest rate loan until it's gone, then hit the next highest rate loan. Naturally, we have to keep up on those essential payments like mortgages. We want to make sure those are that, that credit line, and those are really valuable credit lines to have. You want to make sure that that's showing good history and good payment history in your credit score. If you are having trouble, it's natural. I think most people don't want to address it. They don't want to talk about it. But it actually is really important to talk to your creditors and reach out if you are having, if you are struggling. They sometimes they do have forbearance or they have they do have to have programs to help. So if you are having trouble, reach out. There's not going to hurt by making a having a call, and making a conversation as much as possible. Stay away from those predatory and high interest rate products like those payday loans. They are terrible. Um, luckily, there are kind of some more protections coming for consumers, but please avoid them as much as possible if you can. And then again, check your credit report for errors. A lot of people actually do have errors or things that shouldn't be on there, or they could even be from someone else that are on your credit report. So it's really important one at least once a year to go in there, get each one of your free reports from the three credit bureaus, TransUnion, Equifax, and Experian, and double check that the information there is actually accurate. And if there are things you can dispute, again, you want to do that now while you have the opportunity before you actually need to be going out for something like a mortgage or a car loan or you're trying to lease a car, or you're trying to get a business loan for to start a new business, and then you're having to deal with this in the moment. Told We mentioned we'd, we'd bring this up and certainly want to circle back on it. Emergency fund. This one is so crucial. Um, set up an emergency fund with enough money to cover living expenses for three to six months. We're not saying to keep this in cash under your pillow, not saying to keep it into a, a savings account at your bank that is not yielding anything but it really should be relatively easy to access. So if an emergency were to happen, you can access that money within like a day. Uh, but you wanna look at for things like a high yield savings account or money market accounts that are actually yielding, you know, north of 4%, uh, give or take on any given day, depending on the type of account uh, the bank you're working with. Now that we finally have higher interest rates, it actually helps us to uh, be paying for the money we have in savings. But if you're getting a tiny smidgen and you have a lot of money, uh, in your you know, your savings account linked to your checking account, really look to open up an account that's going to actually produce a higher yield on that savings so that your money is not losing value over time sitting in that account. But we want it to be for three to six months and we want it to be for emergencies. 2020 and the pandemic and what happened to all of us will be the example we use for years and years to come majority of us did not have enough to cover even a, not even close to a month of expenses when the pandemic hit. And that is what caused so much turmoil and chaos outside of naturally the health events and everything else that was going on. But the financial part really did impact as well. So this is why even if you have nothing now and that's okay, start setting aside a little bit of money each month, build yourself up to one month and then go get to two and then get to three. And especially if you're older, you're getting close to retirement, it's important to get you to a point where you have it like at least six months. You want to have enough cushion so that if something happens with the markets or with your job, you know you're going to be okay for a few months. And again, use it for real emergencies only. Try not to think of it as you know an extra savings account you can tap into or long-term savings. This is really meant to be just an if something happens. I know me and my family are going to be okay. We have we have this set aside. We're going to be okay. Uh, along these same lines with the emergency fund, this uh, just just even if you're starting small, if there is no other takeaway you have from what we talk about today, and you start building an emergency fund, I will call it a win. Please, please, please make sure you start to do this. It's it's easier said than done, but it's so crucial. And, and even providing a sense of comfort and security for you and your family, knowing you have something to fall back on just in case something happens. The majority of the financial stress, which actually manifests in itself into health, like actual health issues, is because we don't have a little bit of that cushion just in case something happens. So this is actually 
hugely important for your physical and mental well-being as well. Uh, so please make sure to do that if you can. So there are two layers of the emergency funds. First off, we all need a minimum 1500 to 2000 for things that break. <laughs> Example, kids, cats, cars in this situation. Sudden injuries, oh, fender bender, something doesn't work in my car, all of that. 38% of the time, the expenses are unplanned and they're medical. 28% of the time, it's something with a car breaking down. And 20% of the time, it's actually related to our home. That's statistically, that's actually where, the, where it usually falls. That's why we want to have at least a minimum amount for those unexpected things that do come up. And then think of, again, that bigger picture, that three to six months of the expenses for things that leave, like health, jobs, and spouses. We want to have a backup cushion just in case for the things that can leave us unexpectedly. So when we talk about investments, and I know this is not as much geared towards investments, like there was a, a session on investments yesterday and being a smart investor. Think about, again, what are you saving for? Short term versus long term. Short term are things like, again, that new car, or I really want to go on this vacation. This would be really important to me. Or I want to start to save for a house down payment, or there's something other, uh, some other thing that's important that's in that's coming up in the next six months, one year, two years. That's what we consider a shorter term. Long term is more, of course, retirement way down the line, um, a child's college, things that are going to be. If your child is you know, single digit ages right now, and you you know you it's important to you, or it's one of your values to be able to contribute to their college education. You've got a longer time horizon. What we call a time horizon is how many years until you need to actually fund that expense. You've got more time in order to do that. So that's a longer term. Depending on the, and we don't get into this here too much on the investments, but if something is short term, you're saving for a short term goal, it should not be invested in things that go like this. Like the Bitcoins and the tech funds and you know different types of stocks that are all over the place. That is not appropriate given how short of a term this thing, this goal, this expense, whatever it is, is, is coming up, coming down the line here quickly. It should be in things that are safer and safer and stable, things that don't move as much with the markets because you need to rely on this, this being a set dollar amount of money before um, by the time you actually need it. I know an example of someone that was about to put a down payment in 2020 on a house, their dream house. They did not realize this was uh, a friend of a friend client. Their money was in their company stock and their company stock plummeted uh, right before they were supposed to send the money in for that house. So as a result, they were not able to buy the house because they were saving for a very short term expense for a down payment. And it was in a very volatile stock at an unexpected time in the market and they lost the house. So anything that's shorter term should be things that are shorter term also treasury bills that you can buy directly, things kind of like CDs if you can get the money out, you know, high, money market, those high yield savings account, money market accounts, other types of treasury notes, bills, bonds, those things that are, are a little bit more stable than like the stock market. And the longer term, that could be more towards things that have equity or stock exposure. We don't, we're not relying on the money today, so we can let the market, we can let it appreciate in the market over time uh, to get us there in the future. And again, are you investing wisely? Are you using the right types of accounts? So we talk about tax planning. We also talk about a lot of that is tax, uh, looking at the tax advantage accounts. There are tax benefits to using a 401k, your IRA, a 529, which is a college savings plan. There, The government has provided these tax advantage accounts, meaning there's some sort of tax benefit you're getting you know, for using these tools. Usually that comes in the form of if you're putting money into that, because we think these things are good for you the long term, whether it's saving for college or saving for retirement, we're going to give you a little bit of a tax break. So you might not have to pay taxes each year on how that money is invested. So that but down the line, you'll have to you'll have to pay most likely have to pay a portion of that. But for now, we want to encourage you to save for your future. So we're not going to charge you the normal tax rates you'd have to pay on these investments so that you can continue to build this account as much as possible. So when we talk about tax planning, that's again, that's part of it. Um, are you investing wisely also? So dollar cost averaging. A lot of times we get questions of, okay, so how do I start investing? You know, I have this chunk of money. Do I throw it all in all at once? Or what do I don't know? I just don't know where the market is or a lot of geopolitical risks right now. What does that look like? How do I do this in a wise way? So some people feel more comfortable not throwing everything in all at once. Um, although 
studies have shown that actually it, it's actually immaterial if you throw it in all at once or you do it in chunks over the long term. But some people don't feel as comfortable with that. So if you want to put in the same, maybe I'm going to start to throw $100 a month or $500 a month into this investment account. And I'm more comfortable with that because I just don't know what the market's going to do. And I don't have a full grasp on this. And again, none of us do. None of us know exactly what's going to come or where things are going to go. So maybe you want to start putting in regular amounts. The key thing, though, is that you're putting money in on a regular basis. You're getting into the habit, the habits of starting to save for the future. And then also, of course, diversify. Please do not have all of your investments in these various accounts into just the NASDAQ 2000 or the Teslas and Apples and all the rest of it. It really should be broadly diversified in the markets. So broadly diversified, you can purchase, whether it's exchange traded funds, you know, those ETFs or mutual funds, you can buy a single security like that, that has access to a ton of the different companies. So you know, the S and P 500, you can get, you can buy one specific product or just, uh, that has access. So that security has access to all 500 of those individual um, stocks in, in the proportion they are to that actual S and P 500 index. But make sure also the U.S. is, you know, only 63%, 64% of the total stock market. There's a whole lot more out there too. So you do want to have a little bit of exposure to the other areas of the market because it's not just the U.S. and it's not just U.S. tech. There's a wide swath of, of actual available companies. But before you do invest, again, as much as we want to like, okay, I want to throw my money in. I've seen some of you, have, I have friends who've done so well doing this. It's still the most important that you... I would say at first, build build out that emergency fund, have that that the backup, that at least month or two minimum of expenses covered just in case. But get a handle on your cash flow, go through that spending plan that we were talking about, figure out again what those goals are, what that looks like for you before you start to invest. Start, try to pay off expensive credit card debt. You know, again, right kinds of insurance. If you have a young family members or a spouse, that's where term insurance can also can oftentimes be a good a good choice. It costs 10%, you know, roughly of the cost of permanent life insurance. And it can insure you for the you know, whether it's a 20 year term policy to help you get through maybe having young kids going off to college. Uh, and also make sure you write a will. What do you want your wishes to look like? What matters to you? Who do you want to take care of you? If something happens to make medical decisions for you, who do you want to be able to make financial decisions for you if you're not able to do that? And then where would you want to potentially leave money if you have any left over to other family members? But first and foremost, um, yeah, think about that. Think about all these various pieces. And if and I know it's sometimes it's really hard because we have competing priorities. We have existing expenses. We have credit card debt. We have student loans. But we still want to be saving. We still want to be saving for retirement. How do you actually balance these, right? First and foremost, again, you guys can know what I'm going to say. It's going to be the emergency fund. Second, you want to start looking at those interest rates of the credit cards and paying down because that's actually your most ex other highest line item expense to some extent in terms of like the least profitable expense you have. But if you have a little bit extra here and there, even if it's only a few dollars, again, it's this is all about habits over time and building and creating a plan that helps you build good habits over time. Even if it's only putting in ten dollars a month into an investment account or something, um, something like that outside of just your a company retirement plan, start doing that stuff as much as you can. Um, even if it's in small amounts, and then once you're able to pay off some of these debts, and then you'll start to put more money towards it. But think about your plan. Think about those competing things you have going on and what matters most to you, and think about that as you're actually building it out. So investment approaches that work. Start to invest early. The most important thing all of us have right now, especially if you're in your younger years, is time. The, the way people build wealth, true wealth, is built over time and it's generally built in the public stock markets, in the markets. That even if, again, you only start putting in $25 each pay period, $50 a month, whatever it is, that is actually how you start to build these habits because we want that money to compound over time. And it takes 20, 30 years to really start to see the payoff from that. So um, invest regularly and automatically. Dollar cost averaging in. You know, Use direct deposit from your paychecks whenever you can. And then stay in the market. Even if the market is seems like it's going off a cliff, 
things are really difficult, it's really important that you actually stay invested. It will recover. I know it feels scary. That's why you choose the appropriate investment allocations when you're comfortable, when things are not all over the place so that you can stick it out when things do get more, more challenging and they will, but stick it out. All right. So to start investing, I'm going to go through some of these last few slides a little bit more quickly here. So participate in your employer uh, sponsored retirement plan. If you're eligible, especially if they have a company match, that is basically free money for you. So we want to make sure you're taking advantage of that and you're at least getting the match if your company has one. Open an individual retirement account. That's if you have additional money left over, you want to start saving a little bit more for your retirement. You can do that. You contribute to a college savings account, like a 529 plan that has multiple tax, is very tax advantaged, and then invest in like a taxable investment account. So opening up an account where you can actually invest your money directly. But first and foremost, company retirement plan, then an IRA, college savings, and an investment account. So talking about a, couple, a little bit about risk management. So again, types of insurance to consider for your personal side, health, life insurance, disability, long-term care. Long-term care covers if you have an ongoing medical issue. Um, eventually, Medicare doesn't cover some of this. So that's where long-term care steps in. Disability covers and something happens to you and you're not able to work. For property, there's auto, of course, renter's insurance, homeowners, and a liability policy like an umbrella policy that protects you um, in case something happens, you're, you're found to be liable in, in a certain situation. But also think about what life stage you're in. If you're young and you don't have assets, that may mean you, you, there's, you don't need as much as in, uh, insurance. If you do have a family or you have more assets, that means you might want to look more closely at types of products to make sure you're, you are taking care of yourself and your family members. And again, do you have the right products? They can be expensive. And also coverage can also sometimes be inadequate or excessive. So you want to make sure you have someone you trust that you're talking to, to make sure you have the right policies in place. And again, carefully study the, the fees, the deductibles, the copays, but particularly for your homeowner's insurance, make sure you are keeping up with inflation. Our property values have gone up so much and a lot of people are underinsured, which doesn't really come to light until we have things like fires or floods and things like that. Uh, floods aren't covered actually in Calvary, but uh, fires and they realize they're underinsured and they actually have to go out of pocket a lot in order to have their house rebuilt. So double check where you're at on your policies. So some risks can be handled by reducing the risk. You know, again, a doctor prescribes you medication that makes you groggy in the situation. In order to reduce the risk of a car accident, you might ask a friend or a spouse to drive you. That's reducing a risk of getting into an accident. Um, some of them can be avoided completely. If you have small children, maybe you don't want to buy a house with a pool. You want to avoid the potential for that risk to happen. So think about some of these from a risk perspective when you're deciding on what, you, what you're what you going to do or what makes the most sense in order to be safe. And then again, for step five here, talking about executing the plan, set a timeline. So when we're talking about our plan today, in week one, you're going to work this week on creating your spending plan. Pull together, gather that information, figure out what where things are coming, where, what's flowing in, what's flowing out, and come up with your spending plan. So week two, would be, we would suggest put away those extra credit cards. Week three, let's look at opening up a college savings account if that's important for you or for a family member. Week four, start to check your credit report, et cetera. Again, a plan that is not executed is worthless. It is not valuable if you don't actually apply it to your life. But you can break it down in pieces. You do not have to do all of these things at once. It's most important that you're just considering everything as a whole, and then actually taking the time to move forward with it. So last few slides here before we get to questions. So with financial planning, you can keep control of your spending, manage your debt, build savings and investments, protect your family from financial crises, reduce stress, the financial and physical, and this is so important, it really does reduce stress. And again, most importantly, probably make progress towards your life goals, the things that matter to you. So in order to step six, the last step that we that we have here is monitor your plan over time, whether it's quarterly or annually, we want to make sure, all right, let's do a check in with myself, or maybe you do it as a family. Are we keeping spending under control? Are we saving like we thought we were going to? Why or why not? Are we able to pay down these debts? How are we, how are we doing on making our progress? Anything that's changed in our family or with our careers? And then do we need to make adjustments? So monitor and adjust the plan over time to make it stick. To recap, so again, gather information during the financial planning process. We determine your goals. 
assess our current situation, we devise an action plan, we execute the plan, and then we monitor and adjust over time. In order to get help, and again, we will, I know we're wrapping up here shortly, so there are some other resources. You can always look for financial planners like myself, list a lot of qualified planners in their various areas they work in. A lot of them offer free consultations. You can look in geographically. Uh, make sure to check their disclosures on broker check and then um, other resources, building wealth from the Dallas Fed. If anyone's come to any of our financial planning in-person sessions, we've had these booklets the last year or two. And then Foundation for Financial Planning has a number of consumer resources. So that's that FFPP, uh, FFPProBono.org as well on there. Thank you so much for your time. I'm sorry we're getting a little close, but we're going to answer as many questions as possible. Okay. Um, thank you, Jamie. I don't know where you went, but let's go. Hi, Jamie. Okay, so let's see. We probably have like time for like one or two questions. Um, let's see. How do you actually, with investing, how do you actually get started investing? Yeah, a great question. So within investing, it seems so, you know, we, we talked about it's it's most important to just if you have access to that employer plan, you have a match, do that first. But if you actually want to open up an, your own investment account, you want to look take a look at the some of the large options, banks, the various banks out there, make sure they have a good reputation, but you can whether it's through an app or you want to go through one of the big bank custodians that's been around for ages, you would actually log in, you know, to create an account on there and actually apply for an account, enter your information, they'll verify your identity. And most of them don't cost anything to open. They don't cost you anything to keep them to keep them open. Uh, and then you can actually connect your bank accounts and set up those automatic transfers in there. And you can choose whether you want an, in, an individual taxable account, you want to open up something like an IRA or a five to nine plan. There are so many different options. But the key thing is just do a little bit of research, figure out a bank or a credit union you're comfortable with. And then also once you do open the account, make sure you're actually funding it. So put some money into it and actually start to invest the money. Perfect. Thank you so much. I think we have time for one more question. So you mentioned the emergency fund. So how much, again, should you have in that fund? Great question. Uh, ideally, we want to get to three to six months again. Just I think that's my one takeaway. If, if that's all we learned from today, great. I'll, I'll take it. Uh, you want to get build yourself up to you have at least three to six months worth of expenses. And those are those fixed expenses, like not not that, oh, I want to go dining out and go on vacation. It's my rent or mortgage, my car payment, my utilities, cell phone bill, enough for groceries and enough to cover all the essential needs I have. And multiply that times, you know, three and then eventually get to six. But to at least a minimum, like we were saying, at least 1500 to 2000 for those really unexpected things that just break on you all of a sudden. Okay, perfect. And um, also, if anyone has any other questions that you think of after, you can email us and then we can get your question answered. And our email is lifelonglearning at lepl.org. So I want to thank Jamie again for a wonderful presentation. I always learn a lot of these things. Um, and I have to keep up my emergency fund always. So if anyone missed any of this, we do. It's, it's, yeah. yeah. I know. If anyone missed any of, of this presentation, it will be available for viewing on LEPL's YouTube channel shortly. It's that's the URL is youtube.com forward slash Los Angeles Library. And Financial Literacy Month also continues. Its next streaming program is next Tuesday, um, April 23rd from 12 to 1. That's a budgeting uh, workshop, Budgeting, Developing, or Spending, and Saving Plan with Los Angeles Alliance for Economic Inclusion. And we have two more Financial Literacy Day events with FPA coming up. And our next one is this Saturday, um, April 20th, at, from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. at the Encino Tarzana Branch in the Valley. And 10 a.m., it's going to be a retirement planning workshop. And then from 11 a.m., the one-on-ones for certified financial planners start. So to make an appointment to talk to a certified financial planner like Jamie, um, please give us a call at 213-228-7140. And for more information on all of our Financial Literacy Month programs, you can visit our Financial Literacy Month webpage at www.lapl.org forward slash Financial Literacy Month. I want to thank you all again and have a great rest of your day. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Take care, everybody.